Good morning, Good Bright morning, City family. Good morning, Bright City Church. How are you guys? Woo. It is so good, so good to be with you all this morning, to be together as a family mm -hmm. where God's Spirit can come and dwell among us as a community, uh, knowing that this is a place where we have family. This is a place where we belong, where we know that uh, God is knitting our hearts together as a people. I love how this morning Alex's plan was to keep it very chill and kind of unplugged. It was, it was, it was like an emo vibe. And you guys were like, we're not bringing our emo vibe this morning. <laughs> we're bringing our worship. Like, we are going to worship and joy. We are going to clap. I love that you guys basically, like, forced Alex to do that in the middle of the song. Y'all are it. amazing. Do it. Because Jesus is worthy, right? That's right. Jesus That's is right. worthy of our joy, our praise, our clapping, all of it. He is worthy. And so if you are new, we're so glad that you're here. My name is Sharon. This is Ike. We are the pastors here. We both have coughs. We don't have COVID. I promise we don't have COVID. Ike also, we are like beat up this morning. You have, he has a sty in his eye. He looks like he got punched in the face. I keep telling him he needs to be like, you should have seen the other guy. <laughs> but really, it's just a sty. I don't know why we look so beat up Speak this morning. Speak for yourself. I'm good. <laughs> 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 but anyway, if you are new, we would love to connect with you. And there's a couple of easy ways for you to do that. There is a card in your cup holder. You can fill that out. You can pop it in a basket on your way out. If you want to just sign up virtually, uh, just text Bright City to 94000. That will pull up a link tree where you can click new here. Uh, you can also find that later if you just go to Bright City RDU on Instagram. That link tree is there as well. But we would love to follow up with you um, just to hear more about you, how you'd like to get involved here, answer any questions that you have. Another way that you can get connected is actually immediately after the service this morning. I will be in the lobby. There's a Next Steps banner kind of near the door. And I'm there just to answer any questions that you have about us why do we meet in a movie theater? You know, what does our church believe? Bring me your hard questions. Mm -hmm. I can handle them. I can <laughs> handle your hard questions. So that is immediately after the service. And then also next Sunday, we are doing something that we do once a month called Pizza with the Pastors. We go walk straight across to California Pizza Kitchen. That's around noonish, 1145 noonish. We will be there and we're just there to kind of meet meet people who are new. Um, sometimes other pastors join us there as well, but it's a great way for you to meet other new folks at our church, ask us questions, just have a little bit more face-to-face -face time there as well. So that is next Sunday. Just mark your calendars if you are new. Mm -hmm. So another part of our worship service that we have not fully returned to is, is offering. Uh, Pre-COVID, we passed around a popcorn bucket and we haven't returned to that yet. I'm not totally sure when we will. But we do consider offering to be a part of our worship service. It's not an announcement, but it's how we tangibly demonstrate the priority of God in our lives, where we, we just don't praise God with our mouths, but we walk it out with our lifestyles. And so if you would like to participate in the life of our church, in the, the worship of our church that way, there's two easy ways you can do that. Again, you can text Bright City to 94000. There is a link for giving. You can also go to brightcitychurch.com slash give to set up automatic monthly giving. Now, this morning, I'm going to invite you guys to go ahead and come up here. So this morning, we are kicking off new small groups. Small groups are a really important aspect of the life of our church. Over 100 uh, people at our church are currently involved in a small group at our church, and we are about to grow that number. And so I wanted to introduce you because immediately after the service in the lobby, we will have signups for new small groups. So these are not all the leaders. They're kind of representing mm -hmm. their groups. But Mark and Julie Ellen are representing the mixed stage rooted group. They are <laughs> mixed stage. Um, they are leading with uh, Erica and Brian Watson. You have younger kids. Y'all are empty nesters. There's going to be singles in this group. Um, it's going to be great, but they are going to be going through the rooted curriculum, which y'all might have seen before the service. So one thing that we encourage everyone who considers church, Bright City their home is to go through rooted. Mm -hmm. It's a 10 week curriculum and it reviews the essentials of the faith, but it does it in a way that does not feel too basic. If you've been a Christian your whole life, it's very deep. Um, it's designed to intentionally cultivate community. That's another reason why we really love it. And so it's a really important discipleship tool for our church. And so they're going to be doing the rooted curriculum, I believe. So they will be in the lobby. Um, and then next we have Liz. So Liz is going to be co-leading the 
um, young adult women's group. So that's going to be women in their 20s and 30s. And they're also going to be doing Rooted. Liz is co-leading with Nadia. Nadia could not be here because she is at Disney World celebrating Disney's 50th anniversary. <laughs> so you guys who have been around know that this is causing me terrible, ungodly envy. Um, but it's just reality. Um, so she will be in the lobby for any young women. Then Taylor. Taylor is co-leading with kind of Ike, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then also Austin. Um, a young men's group. Austin, as it turns out, is also not here because he is also at Disney <laughs> celebrating. It's so weird. Not, they're not, and he's not with Nadia. It's like separate. <laughs> Everyone's at Disney without me. I have major FOMO. Everyone. I have Everyone. major FOMO. Um, We're not really here. So thank We're you guys Disney. for being here with me right now. Um, <laughs> So anyway, uh, they are not going through Rooted. This is a more established group, uh, but still, if you are a young adult guy and you're looking for community, um, go find Taylor after the service. That's a great group that meets in our home, and um, yeah, we just love those guys. And then last but not least, Alex is representing uh, Lexi, his wife, um, and then also Sydney and Stephen Pappas, who are co-leading a new young marrieds group that is going to be going through Rooted as well. And so probably Lexi will be, let's see, where's Lexi? Lexi, can you raise your hand? So this is Lexi. So if you're interested in that group, she will be in the lobby so you can look for her. So I believe that is, is everything. Yeah. But if y'all want to give a round of applause to our small group leaders. Um, we're so we're so grateful for them. Small groups is, is a continual need, and y'all can go on ahead up to your seats. Um, small groups is a continual need that we have and something that um, our existing small groups were constant, constantly encouraging to raise up new leaders to create small groups because we have so many new people and we want to make room for them. So I'm really grateful that they stepped up to lead this fall. So that is all for me. Thank you, Sharon. Some technical difficulties here. Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. I am willing, he told him, be made clean. Immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. In 1863, a man by the name of Joseph de Wooster uh, set sail for Hawaii, and uh, in 1864 then took the step to be ordained as a priest and changed his name to Father Damien. And at this time in Hawaii's history, uh, the Hawaiian government had moved all of the lepers into a colony at the camp at Kalapapa on the island of Molokai. And Father Damien, seeing the condition of these lepers, seeing their helplessness, their loneliness, uh, he was moved by their condition and chose to step in and take care of this leper colony. And so he served as a priest, as a doctor, as administrator. He created an orphanage there and served for 16 years as, as leader of this camp and this colony, taking care of them. In 1884, uh, Father Damien discovered that he had developed signs of leprosy, and yet even having de developed those signs himself, chose not to be treated because it would mean that he would have to leave his flock. And so just a few years later, in 1889, Father Damien died from his condition. Fast forward 120 years to 2009, and uh, Father Damien of Molokai was declared a saint by the Roman Catholic Church. We hear this story and think, what would possess a person to do this? What would possess someone to love in such an extravagant, scandalous, risky way, knowingly exposing himself to this illness, knowing it may cost him his life? What would possess someone to do that? It's a radical love, a love that is difficult for us to comprehend, much less to practice and to receive. But this morning, this is the kind of love that I want us to come to terms with, that I want us to come to grips with, because for many of us, for all of us, this is the love that we are being invited to receive in Christ. But for many of us, it's a hard love to receive. It's a hard love to be even open to, much less to be invited to practice it ourselves. Last week, Sharon kicked off our series, Gentle and Lowly, and looking at the heart of Jesus for sinners and sufferers, uh, based on the book by Dane Ortland, Gentle and Lowly. And our whole desire with this series is to lay before you the beauty of Jesus, 
to lay before you the beauty of the heart of Jesus as clearly as we possibly can. And so this morning, as we look at the story of Jesus' encounter with a leper and the narrative of Jesus' care for him, my goal here this morning is not to get you to do anything. It's not even to get you to believe anything new. My entire goal is to help you see and understand the beauty of the heart of Jesus for the broken, the sinner, and the sufferer. To really come to grips with how deep this love is for us. And as I was working through and preparing this message this week, found myself overwhelmed with understanding how deep and penetrating this love is, how beautiful the heart of Jesus is. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 1, verses 40 and following, and start the story here. It says, Then a man with leprosy came to him and on his knees begged him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. This man comes to him and and falls down on his knees and begins to beg Jesus to heal him. He uses this this phrase, if you are willing. The the Greek behind this has the connotation, it's the language of desire. If you desire, if you want to, if you will, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. I am willing, he told him, be made clean. So this leper comes to Jesus, and Jesus, seeing this man's condition, is moved with compassion. Now, I want you to understand how shocking this moment would have been, how scandalous this would have been, what a big deal this would have been for Jesus to reach out and touch this man and his condition. The best way to understand this is to understand what an observant Jew would have thought at this time watching Jesus reach out and touch this man. And much of that would have been shaped by the Old Testament law around how people with skin conditions, uh, what they should do, how they should be treated, what they need to do to, be, uh, to protect the community from this spreading. Leviticus 13, 45 and 46 gives these instructions. It says, the person who has a case of serious skin disease is to have his clothes torn and his hair hanging loose, and he must cover his mouth and cry out, unclean, unclean. He will remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. I think we got the message. He's unclean. He must live alone in a place outside the camp. In this context, it was intended to be a measure of protection. It was intended to protect the community from the spread of this illness. But it came at great personal cost to the individual who had the sickness. They had to alter their appearance. They had to tear their clothes. Their hair had to be unkempt. They had to go around declaring, I am unclean, just to prevent anyone from accidentally getting too close to them. Can you imagine having this condition and having your appearance announce to people your condition and to have to announce for yourself your condition? And so not only was this an illness, this was a sentence on their life. The leprosy would define their identity. It would rob them of their name. It would rob them of their occupation, their habits, their family, their fellowship, their worship community, Their identity was now eclipsed by being a leper. But on top of all of this, to understand that for Jesus to go and touch this leper would have not only been repulsive, but people would have called into question Jesus' sanity by doing this. This wasn't a, okay, Jesus, you do you. This would have been, this is repulsive. Why would you do this? What would possess you to do this? Imagine watching this happen. Imagine being there and not knowing how the story ends. You're seeing this in real time as it's happening. For the first time, maybe you've ever seen somebody reach out and touch a leper. And the tension that builds in you. There's the awe of the compassion that someone would reach out and touch a leper. There's being repulsed by the idea of touching a leper. And then there's shock at the sense of this man imperiling his own life by reaching out to touch him. What would possess Jesus to do this? The story tells us that Jesus was moved with compassion. 
That's what moved him to do this. He was moved with compassion. And I've talked about the Greek word behind this before, and so I'm not going to go into super depth, but the main idea behind this is compassion was being moved in one's bowels. It was this deep-seated gut reaction inside of you. And so Jesus' gut reaction to the leper's pain and suffering was to reach out his hand and touch the man. To reach out and touch this man, to place his hand on on him. Now, I don't know that Jesus had to touch this man in order to heal him. I say that because we saw Jesus in Scripture heal people that weren't even in the same zip code. And so why does he reach out and touch this man if he doesn't have to touch him to heal him? I believe he reaches out and touches this man because he knows the dignifying power of human touch. That as powerful as it would be for Jesus to heal this man's condition, the very placing of his hand on this man, who may not have been touched for years and years in his life, knew that placing his hand on him would be an, an affirmation of his healing, an affirmation of his being, of his humanity, that you are worthy to be touched, to have people close to you again. And what we see from this is that when Jesus sees our fallen, broken state, what we understand is that his impulse, his natural instinct, his gut reaction is to move towards our pain, our sin, our suffering, not away from it. The closest thing that I know to compare this to is my own gut reaction to seeing my children's experience of pain. That when it comes to my children being hurt, and moving towards my children in their pain, I don't have to think, okay, what's the good father thing to do right now? It's just instinctual. You move towards them in their, in their pain. You don't have to ask that question. And so Jesus in this moment isn't asking himself, what is the right thing to do? What is the loving thing to do here? And then deciding to do it. It's the instant reaction of his very heart to move towards places of pain. In the book, Gentle and Lowly, puts it this way. It says, time and again, it is the morally disgusting, the socially reviled, the inexcusable and undeserving who do not simply receive Christ's mercy, but to whom Christ most naturally gravitates. He is, by his enemy's testimony, the friend of sinners. And so in response to this man's plea for help, Jesus says, I am willing, be made clean. I desire to see you made clean. It is my wish. I want to see you healed. And so Jesus' desire is, it's not just a decision to heal the man, but it is his very wish and desire to touch the untouchable and to see him restored. And this restores him not only physically, it restores him socially to his community. It restores him relationally to his family. It restores him financially. He can go back and work now. It restores him to his worshiping community. He can worship with others again. And so it not only restores his body, it restores his identity. And what you need to understand is that Jesus' earthly ministry is one of giving back to people their humanity. That's what he was restoring in this man. The wholeness of his humanity. This compassion reflects the deep heart of Christ And so Dane Orleans puts it this way. He says, If compassion clothed itself in a human body and went walking around this earth, what would it look like? We don't have to wonder. We don't have to wonder. To compound the the pain that this leprosy, this leper would have been experiencing, at this time, as with many illnesses, the, the view or the perspective was that he had done something in order to bring this on himself. That this leprosy was a curse that had come as a result of either his sin or his parents' sin or something in his life. And so this leprosy was a curse in addition to the isolation that a leper would have faced Seeing leprosy as a curse allowed people to feel justified in mistreating and dehumanizing and marginalizing lepers. It is a blaming the victim of a vile sort. And so not only did this man suffer under flesh-eating, nerve-damaging illness that inflicted social isolation, he he was also blamed for his own pain, his own isolation, and his own marginalization. 
I don't know what pain you're experiencing this morning. I don't know what you're bringing in here this morning. But if you feel as though you are to blame for your own pain, I want you to know that Jesus is moving towards you in that and wants to heal that, wants to free you of that, wants to set you free, not only from the pain, but the shame that comes with pain. He wants you to be free. Notice that Jesus did not say he was healed. He said he was made clean. That is a religious declaration. That is a declaration that not only is he healed, but he can return to community. His dignity is restored. He can return to a community where he worships with God's people. He can return to an experience of God's presence. And so the story ends this way. Then he sternly warned him and sent him away at once, telling him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer what Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. The great reversal of this story that you've already seen coming is that contrary to all of history and all of human lived experience, Jesus is not defiled and infected by touching this man, but this man is cleansed and healed when he is touched by Jesus. And this is a signpost of the great reversal that's coming in Christ. It is pointing to an even greater reversal that's coming for all of humankind in Christ and his kingdom. The reversal that's coming is that humanity no longer under the great burden of its own finding its own way to God to be healed. Which, by the way, would have been impossible for this leper. If he had to find his way into the presence of God, but yet because of his condition was not allowed to, this would have been impossible. It was only by Jesus coming to him that he could experience this healing. And God has made a way, made his own way to broken, fallen, suffering human beings, not because he should, not because he must, not because it's the right thing to do, but because it is his natural instinct, his impulse, his gut reaction is to move towards us in our pain. In the third century, the church father Origen wrote this in a sermon on this passage. It says, So, stretching forth his hand to touch, the leprosy immediately departs. The hand of the Lord is found to have touched not a leper, but a body made clean. Let us consider here, beloved, if there be anyone here that has the taint of leprosy in his soul or the contamination of guilt in his heart, If he has, instantly adoring God, let him say, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Maybe the question that you're left with here is, why is this Jesus' impulse? If it is Jesus' impulse to move towards us in our pain, why? And this is one of the most beautiful truths that you will hear about the gospel message. A a truth that I've been overwhelmed with myself this week, which is Jesus delights in us coming to him for our healing. He delights in it. He's not upset by the fact that we need to come to him for our healing. He's not angry because we need healing. In fact, he knew that we need healing. That's why he came Dan Ortland says this, When you come to Christ for mercy and love and help in your anguish and perplexity and sinfulness, you are going with the flow of his own deepest wishes, not against them. He longs for us. It it increases his joy for us to come to him for our healing. Yesterday afternoon, we were playing outside, and all of a sudden I hear our three-year-old girl, uh, Sadie, just shrieking in pain crying out in pain. And I I look over and her knee is bleeding and she comes running to me saying, Daddy, Daddy, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts. And, And even though I was overwhelmed by the sense of fear for her pain, of, of my own pain for her pain, there's a, there's a joy in being the one that she runs to for her pain and for her comfort. And it's very similar with Christ that he takes delight in being the one that we run to in our pain. In fact, when I had to go in and get a Band-Aid and leave my little girl outside, it hurt me to go away from her. Jesus does not want to go away from us. He doesn't want us to go away from him. He longs for us to bring our pain to him. Why? 
Why does Jesus do this? Christ takes joy in us coming to him for our healing because the scripture tells us the church is the body of Christ of which he is the head. In other words, when we come to uh, him for our healing, he is healing his own body. That healing you is a part of him healing his own body. And just as when we have wounded parts in our bodies, we care for them, we nurse them, we bandage them, we protect them, we give them rest, we give them a refuge, we comfort them in order for them to be healed, Christ does so also with us as he longs for us to come to him for our healing. He delights in healing us because it is healing his own body. I want to ask you this morning where you find yourself in this story. Do you find yourself identifying with the leper, feeling as though it is beyond hope, that your healing is beyond hope? Having been in this condition for so long, maybe it's a physical illness that you've been dealing with, and you wonder, is there any hope for this? Maybe it's trauma from your past that you're still dealing with and wonder if there's any hope. Maybe you feel that that it's too much for God, that whatever it is, whatever your pain is this morning, that, that it's too much for God. Maybe you don't identify with the leper, but... Uh, maybe you identify like I do with the others that would have been standing around watching this happen, watching Jesus reach out and touch this leper and thinking, what in the world is this man doing? How does he love so extravagantly? Where do the resources to love someone so sacrificially come from? What would possess him to do this, to love in this way? What Father Damien of Molokai knew is that Jesus' healing of this leper was not a story of physical healing, not ultimately. It was a story of healing this entire man and restoring him to right relationship with God, with others, and in himself. What Father Damien knew is that this kind of love is the cure. That even if it would make him sick and cost him his very life, this love was a cure worth all that it would cost him. This is what Jesus knew and why he knew that he could die on a cross and it would still heal the world. Only in his upside down kingdom does it make sense that death would lead to life. That death would produce life. And so we live out this way of Jesus because we know that the way up is down. The way to healing is self-sacrifice. That Christ puts that on display, and Father Damien knew that and lived that and invited others to live that. Do you know this kind of love? Do you want to know this kind of love? Will you pray with me? God, we come to you this morning hearing a message of your deep desire for us to bring our pain to you. And that even when we don't, God, that you come running to us, that you long to move towards our pain, that in our pain you move towards us. God, whether that is physical, whether that is emotional, whether that is relational, you move towards us. God, if, if there are any here this morning who don't know that love, I pray that they would open themselves to receive it this morning. God, that it would break down any walls in their hearts that that have been a means of protection. But God, walls that need to be broken down so they can experience this kind of love because this love is the cure. It's the cure they've been looking for, the cure they've been longing for, the cure that they've been seeking in everything else in the world. And yet, it's right here. God, may we be open to this love. May we receive this love. May we be healed by this love today. 
In Jesus' name, amen.